The first civilization in Europe began on the island of Crete sometime before 3000 BCE and flourished for about 2000 years, leaving a still undeciphered writing system and an everlasting impact to the later cultures that developed afterwards, which we are still a part of to this day. In this video, we will talk about the famed Minoan civilization of Crete and the great legacy these ancient people left behind, picked up and carried on by their successors for millennia to come. Different dates have been proposed for the first human habitation of the island of Crete. The archaeological evidence reveals stone tools likely dating to the pre-Homo sapiens habitation at least 130,000 years old. However, the definite emergence of a Neolithic culture can be dated to around 7000 BCE with the first farming communities developing across the island. These communities typically consisted of open villages such as those developed on the sites of Knossos, Trapeza, Gerani and others. Numerous fishermen huts were found along the Cretan coast while the fertile plain of Messara was used for agriculture. These Neolithic farmers shared a lot of similarities with their counterparts of the Cycladic islands who had considerable influence on the development of the early Minoan communities. During the second half of the 4th millennium BCE, the Cretans started introducing their own pottery, which the archaeologists mark as the beginning of the early Minoan or pre-palatial period on the island of Crete. The early Minoans developed a social system usual for the late Neolithic Aegean, with the population strictly distinguished between the free men and slaves. The area of Knossos likely consisted of several villages, which were by this time merged into a town with a small group of chieftains on top of the social pyramid. By 3000 BCE, similar towns were developed out of the local communities in Phaistos, Pyrgos and Labena. It is unknown whether these towns were founded as dependencies of Knossos, or rather grew to prominence on their own, but it does appear that Knossos held a special sway over the other Cretan towns since the very early period. The local chieftains were eventually able to accumulate significant wealth, which was done with the control of local and regional trade that was conducted throughout the Aegean Sea. With wealth comes the power, which enabled these chieftains to go on and from the fishing and farming community leaders grow into a powerful aristocracy in control of the political and religious life of Knossos and other cities. The simple single or two-room houses were now enlarged for the aristocracy and their families, located towards the center of the city, which in the case of Knossos was numbering several thousand people. The initial storage houses, which were at the center of economic and likely political life of the early period, now grew into larger facilities. Underneath the later palace of Knossos, the archaeologists discovered traces of what they called the Great House, a two-story building where the collected goods were stored. This shows the early traces of what would later become a well-known palace economy system where the produced goods were collected and stored inside the palatial storages in order to be later redistributed according to the needs of the society. The religion was one of the most important aspects of the Minoan society. The central deity was the so-called snake goddess, an imposing female figure holding a snake in each hand, usually accompanied by servants and mythical creatures, such as the Minoan genie or griffins. 
It is unknown to which extent was the priest class tied to the political system, although it seems possible that they represented the elite that ruled over the Minoan palace centers. Another thing that differed the Minoans from most of their contemporaries was the prominent role and status of women in their society, which although still not fully understood in the absence of the deciphered records, according to the scholars varied from sacred and religious roles to the leading political authority or even a matriarchal system. At the beginning of the 3rd millennium BCE, several other important centers emerged on the island, such as Gurnia on the eastern part of Crete. The town was constructed using the same style, with as little as 60 and as many as several hundred houses built around the larger central facility. Also nearby was a cemetery and a road system connecting all of these features. Gurnia likely controlled or at least held sway over the eastern part of the island with an important connection southwards. Phaistos dominated the southern part of the island, overseeing the smaller communities in the region and extending from the coastal area all the way to the Mesara plain. Even in the pre-palatial period, Phaistos seemed to be the second most important city behind Knossos with a significant population and resources. The far western part of the island was likely less populated due to the range of the so-called White Mountains that dominated much of the area. The main community to the west developed around the town of Kidonia, which although not as important economically, seemed to have had kind of a more distinct identity of its own. Later Greek poets such as Homer and writers such as Strabo noted the existence of a tribe called the Kidones of the western Crete in addition to the Etiocretans, a name which they used for what we today call the Minoans. Strabo added that according to his sources, both Etiocretans and Kidones were indigenous to the island of Crete, which was at the time of Homer's Odyssey also populated with Pelasgians, Achaeans and Dorians. Nevertheless, the Kidones seemed to be related to the rest of the early Cretans, and any difference is difficult to tell, as Kidonia was established and grew through the same process typical for a Minoan center. As these early Minoan centers were now firmly established, the rising commerce greatly contributed to the growth and wealth and also population, enabling the towns such as Knossos, Phaistos and Gurnia to become more urbanized and get the first features of a real city. Therefore, most of the 3rd millennium BCE marked the period of gradual rise of the Minoan culture on Crete and its gradual transformation to what we today consider a civilization. Trade, being the primary source of wealth for the Minoan centers, was at this period still mainly conducted with the nearby centers of the Cycladic culture, islands such as Naxos, Syros, Keros and others. However, unlike the Cycladic centers which were really tiny islands with limited population and resources behind them, the rising Cretans had more than enough both manpower and resources to soon assess themselves as the main civilization of the Aegean and absorb the surrounding cultures into their own. By the end of the 3rd millennium BCE, the Minoan Crete saw the establishment of its first full-fledged palace centers, with the first real palaces constructed at Knossos, Phaistos, Gurnia and other cities. This marked the beginning of the old palace period of Crete and the beginning of the very first civilization of Europe.
The time period of the end of the 3rd and the beginning of the 2nd millennium BCE is usually taken as the starting point of the era known as Middle Minoan, roughly corresponding to the emergence of the first palace centers, or the old palace period on Crete. Besides the emergence of the first palaces on the island, the rise and spread of the Minoan culture, economy and trade expanded throughout the Aegean Sea and the surrounding regions. One of the first traits of the advanced Minoan society was undoubtedly the establishment of the Cretan writing system. In fact, throughout much of their history, the Minoans had no less than two writing systems which they used to record their language, starting from the late 3rd millennium BCE. As their language remains undeciphered to this day, it is difficult to say whether both systems were used to record the same language, or if there was in fact more than one language in existence at the time. The older of the two, called the Cretan hieroglyphics, mostly appears through inscriptions on seals and sea stones, as well as numerous clay documents around the palace centers of Knossos and Malia, and also the city of Petras in the northeastern part of the island. The younger and more famous of the two, the Linear A script, seemed to have emerged at the beginning of the 2nd millennium BCE and was in widespread use throughout Crete as well as the Aegean Islands and other areas where the Minoan influence was present. Linear A, while also undeciphered, was almost certainly used for the administrative and commercial purposes including record-keeping, trade and other day-to-day -day activities of the palace centers. Such widespread use of the Linear A script, as opposed to limited and yet parallel use of the Cretan hieroglyphics, opens a possibility of the older hieroglyphic script being used for the religious purposes. This, however, as well as other possible reasons for the existence of two separate scripts, remain difficult to establish. Either way, presence of the Minoan language only expanded in this period of Cretan prosperity, reaching the mainland Greece, the shores of Asia Minor, the island of Cyprus and going as far as coastal cities of Levant to the east. Along with the Minoan inscriptions, traveled the Minoan goods, pottery, art, jewelry and other traits of the booming civilization of Crete. The geographical position on the island allowed the Minoans to greatly profit from both regional and long-distance international trade, which quickly became the main source of wealth, power and influence of the palatial centers and their ruling classes. Raw materials such as precious metals, ivory and jewelry seem to have been imported in large quantities, especially from the east, including the import of copper coming from Cyprus and luxurious materials and items from Egypt and Mesopotamia. Among the exports were grain, oil, wine, sheep wool, pottery and luxury crafts. Also, the expensive spices constituted an important part of the Minoan trade network, with saffron being delivered from the flower of saffron crocus. Unique to Crete, this spice was likely the most expensive such commodity of the Bronze Age. The biggest trading as well as political center on Crete was its capital city, Knossos, which grew to hold a population of nearly 20,000 inhabitants and more than likely exercised certain form of authority over the other centers, the most important of which, besides already established Phaisos and Gurnia, now included Malia on the northern coast and Zakros on the far east of the island, as well as a number of other smaller palace centers emerging in numbers. The palace center economy was based on the authority of the administration, which oversaw the production of goods in their respective areas. 
The goods would be collected by the palace officials and stored inside the palatial centers, which besides the ruling elites, also served as home to craftsmen and artisans, who created products such as pottery, luxury items and weaponry. All of these resources would then be redistributed according to the agenda, satisfying the needs of both aristocracy and the common people. The Minoan military was predictably focused on its naval strength, and although Minoans were not a militant society and did not have war embodied in their culture, they nevertheless maintained a strong fleet in order to keep the trade routes secure and prevent any possible attack on their island. Being located far away from the great powers of the East enabled the Minoans to relatively freely and peacefully expand their influence throughout the Aegean and Asia Minor. The nearby Cycladic centers, which had previously influenced the Minoans during their early days, were now integrated into the Minoan trade and political network and eventually assimilated by the expanding Minoans. By 1700 BCE, the Minoan civilization was at the point of full political, cultural and economic expansion. However, it was at this time that a large disturbance happened on the island of Crete. What most scholars believe to have been a major earthquake or a similar catastrophe greatly damaged many of the Cretan cities with palaces at Knossos, Phaistos, Malia and Zakros suffering either heavy damage or destruction. This catastrophe, although coming at a very high cost for the Minoan infrastructure, ultimately did not stop the expansion of the Minoan civilization, which with no great enemy to seize the opportunity, was relatively free to immediately start rebuilding its palaces and continue the rise of its power and influence. This period marked the end of the old palace era on Crete and the beginning of the new period of prosperity where the Minoans would proceed to reach new heights greater than ever before. Soon after the old palaces of Knossos, Phaistos, Malia and Zakros were destroyed, major rebuilding projects were initiated throughout the island. As the Minoan civilization had already established the trade routes that allowed it to dominate the Aegean Sea, it was of crucial importance to have them preserved, and during the early 17th century BCE, the Minoans seemed to have been lucky enough not to have a rival power that would capitalize on their weakness. The coastal Asia Minor still served as the vital part of the Menon commerce, where the Cretans had in the previous centuries already established the trading post of Miletus, which served as the main Cretan colony in the area. Also to the north, the city of Troy was growing in the commercial importance as well and represented an important point of export of the Menon pottery. On the mainland Greece, the emerging Mycenaeans began to establish themselves on the Peloponnese, with their main city, Mycenae, soon becoming a partner in the Menon trade network, which only continued to grow and expand despite the recent setback. By 1650 BCE, many of the Cretan cities were significantly expanded, with the palaces at Knossos, Phaistos and Malia completely rebuilt to a much larger and grandier scale than before, thus marking the beginning of the new palace period on Crete. The palace of the capital city of Knossos was by far the largest and represented the height of the Minoan architecture. The complex around the main building covered the area of over six acres, with the monumental staircase connecting the different levels of the palace, which was up to five stories high. 
It contained numerous storage chambers, treasury rooms, bathrooms, toilets, and over 1300 other rooms, as well as a well-built drainage system. A theater was also erected within the complex, accommodating around 400 spectators, where various ceremonies and rituals were held. At the heart of the palace were the administrative, ceremonial and ritual chambers, decorated with luxurious items and colorful frescoes, showing all the wealth and power of the Minoan capital, which at this time numbered as many as 100,000 inhabitants. By 1600 BCE, all of the main palace centers in Crete were fully rebuilt on a scale larger than in the old palace era, with their cities expanded and population increased. In addition to the rebuilt palaces, a number of country villas with small surrounding settlements were established across the island. These villas were richly decorated with frescoes and other features of the Minoan art, suggesting residential area of either political or religious elites, possibly overlooking the less urbanized areas of the island. As the wealth of the Minoans appeared to have reached its height, so did their political power, with the new Cretan colonies established at Rhodes and Kithara, which were now much like the Cycladic Islands integrated into the Minoan Thalassocracy, while the rest of the Aegean was deeply influenced by the expanding Minoan culture. This influence did not stop within the Aegean, as the features of the Minoan cultural presence also appear on more distant locations such as Cyprus, where the cypro minoan syllabic script appears from the 16th century BCE, likely derived from the Minoan Linear A writing system. It's very likely that it was this very period that had influenced the creation of later Greek myths of King Minos and his sea empire, centered around the city of Knossos, where the legendary Minotaur resided in a giant maze called the Labyrinth. King Minos was described as the founder of the legendary Cretan navy that dominated the Aegean Sea and exercised hegemony over numerous islands and coastal cities, one of which was said to have been none other than the city of Athens. The very word Thalassocracy was first used by the ancient Greek writers to describe the government of the Minoans that had firmly ruled the seas during the generations of the heroic age. These myths and stories were likely fragments of memory that the people of the Aegean had centuries later still preserved of this Minoan period. The Minoans themselves seemingly managed to keep their hegemony intact with minimal use of warfare. Apart from a significant navy that the Cretans had likely maintained in order to keep control of the region, there is very little evidence of the existence of a standing Minoan army. Although many weapons such as daggers, swords and axes were found on the island dating to this period, many of those were lavishly decorated and far less prominent than in other Bronze Age cultures. In addition to this, there seems to be little evidence of warfare both on Crete and in other areas where the Cretan influence was established. It was likely that the Cretan navy was big and powerful enough to deter any potential threat to the Minoan interests in the Aegean Sea, while Crete's geographical position made it logistically impossible for any potential distant enemy to strike. However, just as it had been the case in the past, it would not be a human enemy to strike the first blow at the Cretan Thalassocracy. Instead, it would be the power of nature that would rattle the Minoan civilization once again. 
Sometime between 16 and 1500 BCE, the volcanic eruption of Thera destroyed much of this Aegean island, together with its Minoan center, Akrotiri, which was wiped out from the existence. The archaeologists have traditionally dated this event to about 1500 BCE. However, the more recent radiocarbon dating suggests an earlier period, likely a date closer to 1600 BCE. Either way, this event devastated the Minoans, who although probably avoiding major destruction on Crete itself, nevertheless suffered a severe blow, one of which they would never fully recover. The surrounding Cycladic islands, which represented the key component of the Minoan trade network, were devastated, and the powerful Cretan fleet that dominated the Aegean Sea was no more. Unlike several centuries ago when the Minoans were able to quickly recover from a natural disaster in the absence of an external enemy, this time another power was on the rise on the Greek mainland, centered around the city of Mycenae and eager to take advantage of the Minoan decline. Unlike the Cycladis and the Asia Minor coast where the Minoans also projected their political power through their colonies, the Greek mainland was not a part of the Cretan palatial system. The mainland Greeks, mainly those belonging to a tribe known as the Achaeans, had established themselves on the Peloponnese and the regions of Argolis, Laconia and Messenia, and although heavily influenced by Crete culturally, managed to develop their society based on the Menon palaces and yet independent of the Menon authority. The Achaeans established their own palace centers based around the capital city of Mycenae as well as other major centers such as Tyrans, Pylos and later Thebes. Originally a viable trading partners of the Minoans, the Mycenaeans utilized on the long distance trade as well, with their pottery reaching the coastal sites of Western Asia Minor, but also Cyprus, Levant and even Egypt. Thus, the Mycenaean centers managed to achieve significant prosperity and wealth themselves, and by 1500 BCE came to dominate much of the southern Greek mainland. However, Unlike the Minoans, who had exercised a relatively peaceful hegemony based on sea trade and commerce, the Mycenaeans were a warrior society, where kings and heroes earned their glory by war and conquest. As the Mycenaean influence and power spread across Greece during the 15th century BCE, it became clear that the clash between the two powers was inevitable. Due to the absence of the deciphered contemporary records, it is difficult to make an exact conclusion on the events that followed. What we do know is that much like their rivals, the Mycenaeans were renowned seafarers and were more than willing to expand at the expense of the declining Minoans. It is unknown if there was an internal political turbulence on Crete at the time, or the Minoans just weren't able to maintain the firm control over their Aegean possessions and dependencies, but either way, the Mycenaean influence started to gradually replace the influence of Crete throughout the Aegean Sea. The island of Kythera was likely among the first to fall into the Mycenaean political sphere, with the Achaean settlers arriving in the following decades. Similar fate happened to many other islands, including the Cyclades, and it was clear at this point that even Crete itself would be vulnerable to the Mycenaean invasion. On the island of Crete, the capital city of Knossos was still the most powerful and influential palace center, still capable of fighting off any direct invasion from the sea. 
The rest of the island, however, was likely left lightly protected and thus unable to resist the Mycenaean invaders. The far west of the island was inhabited by the Kidonis, the autochthonous tribe different from the Ethiocretan Minoans, whose unconditional allegiance to Knossos was likely not guaranteed at the time of the Minoan weakness. This, as well as any other potential instability, was certainly to be used by the Mycenaeans, who were finally ready to make a move against the declining Thalassocracy of Crete. At around 1450 BCE, the Mycenaean sea invasion was launched against the Cretan island. According to the archaeological evidence, the Mycenaeans did not initially strike directly against Knossos, but rather used the unprotected coastal space between Kidonia and Knossos to land, and then proceeded through the nearby valley southwards against the city of Phaistos. In the subsequent battle, the Minoan defenders proved to be no match for the Mycenaean army, who scored a decisive victory and the palace center of Phaistos was destroyed. The Achaeans likely based themselves around the nearby settlement, known under its modern name Hagia Triada, and soon proceeded forward against the rest of the Minoan palaces. In quick succession, the centers at Malia, Gurnia and Zakros were all attacked and destroyed, together with a number of smaller Cretan centers. Finally, the time had come for the main prize, the capital city of Knossos. The Minoans were now put in an impossible situation, having to defend against several paths to the city as well as from a possible attack coming from the sea. The capital city of Knossos, the wealthiest and the most powerful palace center on Crete, ultimately fell to the Mycenaean army. While the city itself was not destroyed like the rest of the Minoan centers, its fall completed the Mycenaean conquest of Crete and the end of the Minoan civilization. Although we do not know the names of the kings and military leaders involved in this war, the subsequent Greek oral tradition and mythology record a prince named Tectamos or Texaphos, who was credited with the conquest of Crete, leading an Achaean expedition from Aeolus, supplied with the contingents of Dorians and Pelasgians. The reigning ruler of the Ethiocretans, an eponymous king called Cress in the mythological accounts, was thus defeated and replaced by Tectamus himself, signifying the Achaean takeover and the arrival of the new settlers. From 1450 BCE, we enter the period of Mycenaean Crete, where the city of Knossos would continue to be the capital of the island, but as a Mycenaean rather than a Minoan palace. The Minoan culture and legacy, however, would not perish, as it continued to exercise great influence and became an integral part of the Mycenaean society. The Minoans themselves, known from this point on as the Ethiocretans, meaning the true Cretans, would continue to be a part of the Cretan society, even with a certain degrees of autonomy in some cases, but that's a story for one of the next episodes of the Minoan history. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button in order to get notified on the future content on the Minoan Cretans and many more topics that we will cover on this channel. Special thanks to History with Sai, Nico, Chris Ernst, Panayotis Yanopoulos, Fred Lecky, Vineyard Illuminations and Estate Care for their continuous support. If you wish to join our Patreon community and partake in the decisions for some of our future videos, feel free to click the link in the video description.
This was 1XTV and we'll see you again soon.